Hello, 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 Jordan Sherrod and live Monday, status quo, uh, February 6, 2023. Uh, big show today by popular demand. We're going to dig deep into third parties, uh, not just the whole, you know, shit, a progressive run in the Democratic Party or the third party on the presidential level, which I think is a very small part of uh, the discussion but really focusing on uh, the local level of third parties, uh, focusing on the obstacles uh, in terms of ballot access, shenanigans from the Democratic Party and Republican Party that come in the way of third parties. Um, you know, strategy in terms of media, marketing, legal, it's going to be a lot. Uh, so we have Renee Johnston joining and us. And independents. We oh. have an independent as well. So yeah, we'll be uh, talking about third parties and running independent. Yeah. So uh, we're going to have some greens on, some independents. Um, you dip into social socialist alternative as well. Uh, so uh, we're going to have a couple candidates, uh, present and former, joining us in a little bit. But Renee... Uh, you could kind of introduce yourself first because uh, you were a volunteer uh, for uh, Movement for a People's Party, which uh, we've done some reporting on this channel about. Uh, but you're also a Green Party member. So tell the folks a little bit about yourself. Um, Renee, I am registered Green Party in the state of New Jersey. I'm also a member of Socialist Alternative, which I've been a member of for a few years now. Um, I used to live in New York, so I'm actually in the New York branch, even though I relocated to New Jersey. Um, and yes, I was a former member of MPP. <laughs> used to do a lot of work in the New York branch, trying to uh, to pull together, um, you know, a group in that state so we could get some work done. And that ended in a total dumpster fire. So, yeah. You mean it wasn't a movement for a concert. people's party? <laughs> Oh well, uh, yeah, also I was. So Zayna and I actually go way back to when I was a volunteer for Brand New Congress, which I was involved with for a few years, helping to try and start a student-run chapter of that organization. Because in in my day-to-day -day job, I'm actually an educator. I work in a high school. Um, I'm a guidance counselor. I'm like twenty-something years in working with students. And um, we'll get back into kind of your experience volunteering. Not, I mean, we've already we've already heard from you as far as MPP, but kind of the obstacles because all these folks that are uh, throwing out screw the Democratic Party, go third party. Maybe they haven't done it yet because there are a lot of obstacles. Uh, not saying don't do it, but we want to give the accurate information from people who have tried it. Uh, you obviously, Zaina, uh, was heavily involved in MPP. Uh, so we'll get into that. Uh, like we said, in a few minutes, we're going to have Green Party candidates on, independents on. Zaina put this together. But we thought it would be good to start kind of getting into um, on the presidential level, because we will discuss uh, whether a, you know, whether we should do a third party run uh, in 2024 for the presidential independent run. Uh, we should talk about President Biden because contrary to the pom-poms that he's out there throwing out um, in terms of the economy is doing great and unemployment is at a historic low and GDP and yada, yada, yada. Uh, well, maybe the Democratic Party and Biden uh, want to make it that everything's dandy, but apparently by the polls, um, the American people don't agree. So first one, um, Washington Post, few Americans are excited about a Biden-Trump rematch. Uh, the Washington Post ABC poll finds. So Biden and former President Trump uh, may have each drawn a record number of votes in 2020. But at this early stage of the 2024 cycle, Americans have little enthusiasm for a rematch. Um, neither Biden or Trump generated broad excitement within their own party. And most Americans overall say they would feel dissatisfied or angry if either wins the general election. So among Democrats and Democrat-leaning independents, the post-ABC poll finds 58% say they would prefer someone other than Biden as their nominee in 2024, almost double 31, the 31% who support Biden. This is statistically unchanged since September. So despite 
the rhetoric coming out of the Democratic Party and Biden and their media sycophants of a great economy, um, I mean, almost 60 percent say they want somebody else. Um, Republicans are roughly split between nominating Trump or someone else, while most Democrats prefer alternative to Biden. So that's the Washington Post ABC poll. Um, more than six in 10 Americans, 62 percent, say they would be dissatisfied or angry if Biden were reelected in 2024, while 56 percent say the same about Trump. So that's the Washington Post, which led to a pretty, I'd say, uh, unusual um, tweet from Julian Castro. I mean, most of the Democratic Party establishment are, you know, pom-poms, Biden should run again, even though privately they're probably saying he's a train wreck. Uh, but Julian Castro, citing this Washington Post poll, uh, he ran in 2020 uh, for a couple minutes. Uh, he's saying it's the general consensus that Dems are content with Biden in a Trump rematch, but this poll undermines Biden's central argument for renomination. Two years is forever and it's just one poll. But if he's faring this poorly after a string of wins, this should be worrisome. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not a Julian Castro person, but he's certainly right. I mean, two years out or not, he is not this level of enthusiasm, despite all the narrative that's coming out from Biden, that the economy is doing great. And uh, from where I got in, uh, you know, Americans are doing much better, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that is very low enthusiasm. And it also gets worse when you look at the Associated Press poll. Uh, if you have that, Colin, uh, most people think Biden should not run again uh, in 2024. And if you look at it uh, among Democrats, 62% uh, don't want him to run again. Uh, <laughs> overall, 78% don't want him to run again. And independence, boy, 88%. Can I make a Biden. note about independence uh, real quick, Jordan? Uh, sure. 64 to 73% of the country right now are registered independents. So independents actually make up the bulk. Only 20 to 25% are less than 20% are registered as Republicans and Democrats now. So most of the voters are independent. So when you look at that, you can almost say most of the voters would vote 88% oh, disapproval rating among the majority is, is high. <laughs> yeah. Big time. And honestly, like, you know, we don't need to go in the weeds, but bottom line, like presidential elections are decided mostly by the independent voters, not the imaginary, like, you know, swing voter or Reagan Democrats. It's independent voters. So 88 percent saying uh, Biden shouldn't run again, despite all this marketing and narrative about a great economy. Uh, it's pretty bad. Obviously, Republicans, you know, you would expect you know, overwhelming, don't want him to run again. Uh, 18 to 29, which just bailed out the Democrats during the midterms. Uh, young people, particularly in that 18 to 29, came out significantly for uh, the Democrats. Uh, obviously, by these numbers, not because of Biden, <laughs> but because of uh, the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade. And uh, it's not so good. I mean, 60 plus. I mean, that's Biden's like bread and butter. Uh, no disrespect, because plenty of baby boomers uh, don't like Biden. Uh, but yeah, it's just across the board, really bad. And I don't really see these change these numbers changing, Renee, so much because what's going to change? It's just gridlock Not, in Congress. Nothing's going to change. And I don't know why anybody's surprised, because when the man ran, he said very clearly that nothing will fundamentally change. He was very clear that his goal was not to do anything and he's done exactly what he promised to do which is nothing so right. you know we can make all these pronouncements and he can come on and say these things and blah 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 but you know people were in houston climbing into dumpsters outside of supermarkets because there was no power and like people are struggling and i just i don't even know i don't even have a good answer that's how bad it is is there isn't even, there isn't even like a good, like, okay, well maybe this thing will happen. <laughs> like, I, I, it's craziness. It's craziness. Yeah. And I think uh, Zaina, and again, smash that like button. We're going to be bringing on our third party guests in probably two or three minutes. Uh, but Zaina, 
what's interesting to me is, I mean, it's uh, Trump's obviously running, uh, indicted or not, but like Trump's <clears throat> popularity, even in the Republican Party, is very low. So the fact that I didn't show it, but like head-to-head -head polls right now basically show Trump beating Biden by like two or three points margin of error. Has Biden getting his ass kicked by neo-fascist Ron DeSantis? Um, Kamala Harris, worse by both of them. So for the topic at hand today, obviously we're not going to just talk about the presidential. Um, we want to talk about third parties and independent runs on the local level as well. But on the national level, it's, it certainly would be a challenge, but it seems like there's an opening because other than DeSantis, who has had a honeymoon from the media, most Americans don't like Biden and most Americans don't like Trump. So it seems like if it was an independent who ran or a Green Party candidate who ran, I'm not going to blow smoke that they would win. Uh, it's an uphill challenge, but they could do better than Jill Stein did or uh, Howie Hawkins did. And well, I mean, it depends on how they go into it, right? Like, it depends. Like, do they do any of the local work? Do they have a base set up in multiple states? Are they able to communicate to voters? Are they going to try to talk to people who don't normally vote? Because, you know, if you can bring people to the polls, maybe you can, you know, get at least a decent number in some places. There's so much that gets left on the table because... People are too busy fighting about whether they're red and blue, DNR, and all these things, and nobody is doing anything reasonable. Right, Rene, are you saying are you saying that you can't just run a podcaster for president and have no infrastructure <laughs> and expect to win? Is that what you're saying? That might be what you're saying. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I'm. I hate to be the bearer of bad news for people, but like. This idea that somebody can just jump up because they have a million followers or two million followers or whatever it is and run for president and win is ludicrous. Like the system is set up to prevent that from happening. Like literally the system is set up to prevent that from happening. And even if you have it, you know, like the Green Party has at least some kind of infrastructure, right? They have state parties and organizations and they have ballot access in some places and they have a ton of people who actually have won local seats. But the issue is, and the minute it comes time to something that is for a federal seat, you are fighting a battle against a system that was literally written to ensure that you don't have that ability to do that. It's all to block everybody else. And for all the conversations that people like to have about how shitty the Republicans are because, you know, they're trying to prevent people from voting and, you know, this, that, and the other thing, the Democrats are really quick to push people off a ballot or to prevent people from getting the ability to run or to prevent people from being able to even have a party in the state. I mean, even there's with so the many reasons. name, Renee, how many people did we see when we were at brand new Congress that that registered Democrat? That doesn't mean they were working with the party because none of them were almost. There were a couple that we were not. We were iffy about Renee and I, but there were, you know, most of the people we helped weren't even affiliated with the Democratic Party at all. They just put that D by their name right. so they could get on the ballot. And the party did everything to throw everything against them. Right. So, yeah. I mean, you know, it's not even just the third party and independence. But I was going to pull this up really quick. Uh, Max says, interestingly, Trump will again threaten a third party run if he doesn't win the GOP primary. Imagine putting a leftist against Joe, Trump and DeSantis. So, you know, Trump is introducing this idea of I'll buck the party and I'll run independent. And so that's going to that that rhetoric's going to be thrown into the mix for the for that. And I, I wonder what it's going to do for like off cycle races and local and, and state elections with him threatening to run independent. Will other MAGA Republicans do the same? Right. So right. will this space be kind of co-opted with that? I'm just interested to see what kind of happens with that. A few things, because we're about to bring our guests in. Number one, smash that like button. Uh, right under the video, the more people that press like, the more people that we'll see. Uh, super chats are welcome. So thank you. Thank you. We'll read them at the end. And just to avoid phone calls after this, because I literally have gotten three phone calls over five days. I won't name names, 
so from some people ticked off that I haven't dropped my newborn baby and the book I'm writing to invite them on to interview them as a third party presidential candidate. Uh, if you're watching and you're ticked off that you weren't invited on this panel as a third party candidate, this is the first of several shows we will be doing. So if you weren't invited on today, you will be, you will, well, not everybody, but we're going to interview other people, including people running for president as independents and third party. So please stop calling me. And you know, I've literally gotten three calls from one person. Uh, anyway, I digress. <laughs> um, let's bring on our uh, guests. Um, hold on. Let me bring you all on. Um, Zaina, if you, you set this up, so if you want to introduce everyone. Sure. Um, so guys, we brought on uh, one of this discussions because we started out talking about the presidential race, but there's so much happening at the state and local levels as well. So much legislation coming across, you know, anti-abortion legislation, legislation ch chipping away our rights, um, right to vote or right to work legislation, which is essentially anti-union. So all of this is going on in municipalities, state houses, you know, and, and and there's a lot happening while we're looking at the presidential election. And we have brought on some uh, candidates that, that ran independent, um, ran Green Party. So let me let me get into um, who's joining us today. And thank you all so much uh, for joining. Um, for those of you that sort of missed Renee's introduction, who just joined the panel, um, Renee had worked at Brand New Congress with me years ago, so uh, she worked there, so is familiar with running those insurgent campaigns as well and, and what that looks like, then volunteered for uh, People's Party and now works with the Socialist Alternative and also has an organization called Mind Your Volunteers that focuses on organizing and uh and effective training for volunteers and, and positive treatment for volunteers as well. We also have Terrence. And by the way, and by the way, uh, Renee is the one that tipped us off to what was going on in Cop City. So that's how we that's right. First, that's how we first started uh, researching it and then sending Tina. A lot of our stories come from viewers and Renee uh, told us what was going on there weeks before we went. So thank you. That's right. That was awesome. And hosted an awesome panel. So if you guys visit her Twitter, check out the, the Cop City panel that she hosted a little while back. Um, Terrence Kudney um, is uh, <clears throat> the co-founder co of Medicare for All Everywhere. He's a former independent state candidate for Massachusetts 4th District, uh, ran last cycle, so is all kinds of familiar with uh, running for a state house seat as an independent. Um, we also have, and uh, Craig, if I mispronounce your last name, please forgive me, but, and then you can clarify, uh, I know all about uh, mispronouncing names. <laughs> so if, uh, if you need to clarify, please do. But Craig Catiano, who ran in Hawthorne, New Jersey um, for city council as a candidate in 2021 for the Green Party. Lastly, we have Justin Beth former Green Party USA co-chair and former Bernie Sanders delegate in 2016. So we got a lineup of folks that's been there, done that, is doing the thing um, to talk to today. And uh, like we said, not just presidential candidates and not just the, uh, you know, the big names, but it's important to hear from people on the ground, to hear about their experiences so that we can... Uh, we can better assess what's going on because there's a lot in the mainstream media that said that's not true about running independent. A lot of people don't understand how third parties are even built. There's a lot of rhetoric going around. We're just going to start a third party tomorrow overnight. And also people overlook the opportunity to run independent, which in a lot of municipalities um, is, is very possible. And there's not even there's not even a party option in some of those seats, as well as, you know, for state house races and things like that. Running independent is a possibility. So with when those discussions aren't even being had, um, the information isn't getting out there and there's a lot of a lot of misinformation. So would love to hear from you guys um, today to talk about what it takes to run the importance of third parties, you know, how you guys feel about it. And uh, a lot of questions around, you know, what you guys have experienced on the ground. Yeah, I think we should start. I, everybody focuses on 2024, but I think we should f really focus on the local level first. Um, because honestly, that's where third parties and independents have had the most success. 
Uh, so, you know, we could start uh, maybe with um, the person who ran as independent. Um, can you kind of talk about, obviously, we don't have three hours for uh, Democratic Party horror stories, but can you kind of talk about what made you want to run independent um, and what was like the top line kind of obstacles, uh, I assume, you know, uh, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party locally not welcome you, not welcoming you uh, with with open arms. Yeah, sure. So yeah, running independent um, was a was a big concerted choice. I mean, the thing is, um, in Massachusetts, where I ran, essentially, we have basically a one party system in the state, you know, it's, it's basically run by the Democrats exclusively. Um, uh, you know, in my uh, house in the state Senate, it's 37 Democrats to three Republicans. Um, so when you talk about, you know, power corrupting, you know, <laughs> the, the fact is whoever's in power, you know, it succumbs to the problems of power. Right. Um, and so, you know, suffice it to say, I ran against uh, a quote unquote moderate Republican who'd been in office for uh, 28 years, had run unopposed for 18 of those years. Um, and so it, I got the sense that there was a an opportunity to try something a little different, you know, for someone in, in uh, for someone who had, who was a Republican in a quote unquote liberal state, right? Um, there's an opportunity to say, uh, okay, there are other options out there. Um, and what I like to say is I've always been an independent, um, you know, since I could vote, that's where I've been registered. Um, and, uh, you know, there's an opportunity to reach more voters. One of the things that I felt was most vindicated by my campaign was I was able to speak to so many more um, people than I might uh, if I had a D or an R next to my name. And, you know, got to talk to conservatives who were anxious to hear about universal health care, you know, really wanted to see us have a, a universal health care system. And, you know, uh, conservatives who wanted to see, um, you know, us take better care of the poor uh, and working class. Um, and, you know, those are things that, that were surprising, uh, but really just refreshing and really sort of indicated the idea of running as an independent. Um, as to obstacles, I'd say one of the biggest obstacles was unfortunately reaching out to, um, you know, Democratic city and town committees and having them basically say, well, we're not interested in speaking to you unless you have a D next to your name. Um, you know, I had, a, I had several that actually were very open to the idea, um, which was great, uh, but there were <laughs> several more, I should say, that uh, weren't particularly interested in hearing from an independent. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to talk more about the challenges there. Uh, but, you know, I was proud of the race we ran, obviously we came up short, um, but it was uh, really worthwhile as, you know, a first time grassroots a candidate with, you know, sort of no institutional support um, to just give it a go. And uh, one, one follow up, I mean, Massachusetts is, correct me if I'm wrong, that's like machine Kennedy land. I mean, obviously, like the Kennedys aren't modern day anymore, but still like the ghost of you know, the Kennedy machine, uh, I have family there and it is like blue, no matter who in most parts. Um, so can you kind of talk about when you spoke with, uh, voters, I know you spoke with conservative voters too, uh, where you kind of, did you hit that hit up against that wall of people liked what you said, but like, they're just Democrats because that's Massachusetts. And how did you, how did you kind of try to persuade those people? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely did run up against that. And the, and the fact is, you know, a lot of people, especially when you have the opportunity to say, you know, I'm the only run, person running against the Republican in the race, you know, once the, the primary season was over and, you know, it was it was clear that there wasn't going to be an alternative um, to the Republican on the stage. Um, that was something that really kind of opened the doors for me. You know, the fact is, and again, I, I said this when I talked to, you know, city and town, uh, Democratic city and town committees, which was, you know, I, I imagine that your first goal is probably to elect Democrats. I get it. I'm not a Democrat. Um, but, you know, I imagine your second goal, uh, pretty closely tied, is to get rid of a Republican, right? And, and that's what I'm offering, is the opportunity to get rid of a Republican and, and also move forward progressive policy, which I think matters to you as well. Um, and generally, when people heard that, you know, kind of argument laid out, um, they were certainly more open to it. And I definitely did run, run across some you know, concerns like, okay, what happens if a Democrat jumps in? You know, I made a, an effort to get into the race early um, to kind of establish myself and make it clear that, hey, there is like a real challenger here um, that really wants to change, you know, shake up the system, shake up the way things are run um, in the state. And, uh, 
you know, basically try and get ahead of the, you know, third party spoiler kind of question um, by, you know, making the case early and often. Um, so yeah, suffice to say some challenges, a lot of people encouraging me to, you know, switch my party affiliation, even after I, I could, um, there was a, a deadline in, in May basically, um, where I could no longer switch my affiliation, even if I'd wanted to, which, you know, spoiler alert, I didn't. Um, but you know, uh, that, that was, uh, yeah, it was a big challenge. Um, and I'm sure the other two, uh, folks could speak to the challenges as well. The other two, uh, panelists. Zayna, if you want to jump in. Oh, no, I, I don't really have anything to add. Just, uh, there's, uh, questions that I have <laughs> in general. Um, I think that one of the biggest questions to me, um, this is, is this is directed at the, the candidate. So whoever wants to jump in first or Justin, you might have information on this, but what are some of the, you know, access to tools and access to, um, voter rolls? are two of the was two of the biggest barriers for candidates that I help, you know, especially independent and third party candidates before. Um, how did did you guys have any experience with that? I know in some places like my insurgent candidates, they were charging them thirty, forty thousand dollars for voter uh, access to voter rolls. And then they would charge the Democrats, you know, four thousand and the Republicans three thousand, even though they have the you know, party money backing them. So that was one way that they kept information as well as um, fundraising apparatuses used to be primarily just for the party. So there was, you know, the one for the Democrats and then Act Act Blue and then the one for the Rep Republicans, which it's red something. I can't remember what it's called. Um, as well as NGP Van, for instance, which is access to voter rolls, access to be able to email people to create the list. Um, so one of the biggest barriers that we found was access to that, even for incumbent Demo or insurgent Democratic candidates that had the D by their name, but also for independents and uh, others that were running third party. Um, what are some ways that you guys found around that? Was that a big barrier for you in uh, in building a race and a campaign uh, from the ground up without, you know, that kind of massive infrastructure behind it? Whoever wants to jump off first, you're welcome. I saw I saw Justin making faces. <laughs> uh, there we go. Um, thank you for having me on. Uh, the invite, um, Zaina and Jordan, for having us on. Um, yeah, so um, it's an interesting problem, like, you know, uh, voter lists um, and some of that data, um, you know, um, even after you get voter list, sometimes you need to get like a, maybe a, a third party software to actually manage that. And um, so it, it, you know, as a as an independent or uh, um, a third party minor party candidate, um, you know, you, you got to invest those resources to, you know, um, that being said, you know, uh, with a list and with a lot of elbow grease, you can work with Excel spreadsheets or Google Sheets and you know, um, put together walk lists, for instance, um, you know, um, so sometimes in the Green Party, we make do with very little. And, um, you know, even though um, recently in Maine, where I'm at, um, you know, I've, so I've been, you know, with the Maine Green Independent Party since 2017. Um, and um, at, done a little time at the national level. And, um you know, we actually just recently invested in uh, getting the um, the Secretary of State's uh, voter information lists, which is really valuable. Um, if we were working from all data, it was hard to knock on the right door, right? Because people move. And, um, you know, so um, that investment was really crucial to winning a big race for city council in Portland. Um, Anna Trevorrow uh, got elected in the off year, the odd year, 2021. And, um, you know, talking about third parties, right? We, um, the Green Party, we run candidates in as many states as possible, um, at every level possible in every single election cycle. And it's, it's not just every four years. Um, but that data was really crucial to Anna's win. And I mean, even then we were working off of spreadsheets and, and, you know, hard copy uh, printouts of um, uh, walk lists, but um, you know, Anna's campaign and she had the right strategy is to knock on every door um, 
of likely voters, <laughs> right? Uh, you can't knock on every single constituent store. But I mean, uh, she put in the elbow grease and it paid off in a big win. Um, Portland City Council. Um, we've had Greens on Portland City Council before. It's the largest city in Maine. Um, so um, lots of challenges with data. But, um, you know, uh, sometimes you just have to, again, do some elbow grease. And, you know, it, but it takes investment into the, getting some of those resources that you really do need to run an effective campaign. And could you kind of talk about uh, the bar the uh, b barriers in terms of how many signatures you had to get? Because they also make they also have a higher bar for Green Party, third party independence in most places. Um, I'll just I, I would like to hear from Craig a little bit, too, or, you know, some of the other panels. But just briefly, Jordan, you know, um, the discussion of signatures for ballot access right in some, in some states you you pay a, a, a fee right um every state is very different and you know so i can't speak to every single state in maine um we have some complicating things we you know um talking for a uh, federal level race um you know it's 2000 signatures for a senate race um but those have to be from party members so um we have 40,000 Greens in Maine, but tracking down all 2,000 people is actually very difficult. Um, a lot harder than you think, because we don't have like their email addresses. We only have um, their address. Um, you know, it's um, it's not like standing at a supermarket collecting signatures. Um, so, but every state has very unique challenges. And it's important in building this infrastructure to get people that know for every single office, what the challenges are, and uh, you know the the group working together to to how can we overcome those challenges? So um, you know, for Anna Trevorrow, it's a um, nonpartisan race, even though she's a green, right? So, but she's still on the city council, so it matters for us. Um, but it was like I think three hundred signatures, which she was able to do, and she was able to get those from any voter for a nonpartisan race. So she got her signatures in a couple days at the farmers market. You know, um, but yeah, she's an amazing candidate and um, really did well. So, and um, Craig, kind of a similar question to you because Massachusetts, Jersey is also a machine state, heavy Democrat. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the last go around for the governor's race, the Republican candidate did a little better than expected. But you know, for the most part, um, the the biggest counties tend to be very blue. Uh, also very corrupt, uh, Bob Menendez and, you know, the rest of the gang. Uh, can you kind of talk about what made you join the Green Party and, you know, some top line obstacles you've had in, in your race? Of course. Thanks for having me. And great to meet you, Renee. I can't wait to see you hopefully at our uh, state convention this year. And uh, Justin, long time no talk. <laughs> but uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my pathway was a little different. I'd always been politically involved uh, growing up and uh, a lot of issue-based stuff. Uh, I was probably 15, 16 years old when I was supporting and still trying to fight for Mumia Abu-Jamal's freedom and uh, kind of fell into out of politics for a bit. I went to sleep during the Obama era, but I came back for Bernie. So in 2015, I started to help organize in North Jersey for Bernie. Uh, made a lot of my contacts I have now and I'm still friendly with, even though obviously we have this whole you know, debate inside outside strategy. 2016, obviously after what happened at the Democratic uh, Convention is when most of us decided to migrate over to the Green Party. So from 2016 on, I've been organizing and Jordan had a pleasure meeting you years ago at that People's Convergence Conference down in DC. So yeah. my pathway was a little different in terms of I decided to get into the party uh, as a membership, uh, then into the national delegate role. Uh, assigned, you know, on behalf to represent New Jersey as one of our two delegates. So a lot of national platform uh, amendments and changes and suggestions and attend a lot of our conventions. Then I started to get involved with New Jersey as the state co-chair. So I've had a couple terms of co-chair. So I've seen all sides of local races, state races, the, the, the gubernatorial races. So I eventually decided to run as a candidate locally. And uh, yeah, I mean, the barrier and the reason why I went local and obviously as a green is because in my town, in my ward, the Democrats didn't even bother running a candidate in 2015. So when that cycle was up in 2019, I figured they didn't run anybody. And honestly, they left it, you know, as, as hanging fruit. And the way I look at it is a lot of the state and local races, you only need maybe about a hundred signatures 
but they'll challenge you. So you always want to get 200 or 300 or 400 just to counter that. But yeah, I mean, in New Jersey, it's a machine state. It's pretty much one party rule. But we've done well in attending actions and, and making coalitions with some of these other uh, groups. So we've run very successful campaigns against Menendez with Madeline Hoffman, uh, against Booker. And she's been our kind of like our banner uh, woman candidate for the last few years. And she's helped achieve us winning uh, third place out of all these races, these major congressional, I'm sorry, Senate races and gubernatorial race. So it's trying to build the state party infrastructure with exposure with our candidate, but also running real campaigns on real issues. And uh, Madeline for sure would be at any event, even during the pandemic, we were out at events, showing up masked, of course, and trying to, you know, basically be in the space. But running local, I feel is a very important key that we're missing. Uh, and I always tell my my allies in New Jersey, get involved in your your town committees, get involved in your environmental commission, your green teams, things like that. Build name, build exposure first, and then when you decide to run for office, you'll have a little bit of a base, a little bit of following. So it's not like you're just dropping your name in out of the blue. And I know a lot of people get hung up on this whole national thing. You know, there's been a few of the squad winning races out of nowhere. Their names coming out of nowhere. But honestly, I think you could do just as much good locally and win if we take the different, a little bit of a different approach where you do run local. And obviously, running for office is not easy. I give consideration. I give thanks to everybody watching this has run for office at one point. It takes a lot of time and energy and, yes, money. And that's the toughest part is asking people for money when we know our supporters are usually not able to donate a lot. Right. And uh, Renee... Touching on uh, what Craig was saying, because you're in Jersey, um, when when you have this kind of idea that, you know, just you could just run and, you know, uh, compete. Can you kind of talk about in your experience with Green Party and others, um, have you found voters uh, receptive to considering third parties? Because the idea typically comes from the media. Uh, that these are spoiler candidates or, you know, not serious, et cetera, et cetera. But especially, I would say, younger people, working class people. Uh, what's been your experience? You know, Green Party, MPP. Uh, is there a larger um, interest or is there a uh, larger willingness uh, to entertain Greens, independents, uh, et cetera? I think it's it's tough, right? Because the problem is a lot of people only know what they hear about. So if all you do is watch CNN or MSNBC or, you know, whatever the regular local channel is, you don't even know that these people are running. You don't even know that there's an option outside of the Democrats and the Republicans. So sometimes if you're that voice of somebody who's different from those two main parties, you get a lot of like weird looks sometimes when you try to talk to people about who's running that's not part of the duopoly, like who, you know, who this person is who's not a Democrat or a Republican is because people just don't have those conversations. It's not supported in the media. It's not supported with, you know, unless you're paying attention to real independent media. If you live in this area and, for example, you listen to WBAI, like I do because I'm a member and I send, <laughs> send money all the time, um, you might get information about, you know, the independent candidate or the local person because those outlets are actually looking to bring you information about everybody that's running. They're not just focused on who the bigger person is and you know who's running in the two major parties. But if you're not looking for that information, you're not going to find it. And then you end up really in this place where the only thing you're aware of are the things that you see on major media or the people who can afford to mail you something, you know. And what I find as is probably the most troublesome thing is there is not a lot of communication with just regular people, right? Like this idea that you're going to just run third party for a statewide federal seat and you live in one place and your state has millions of people and you don't have people in every single area that's able to like knock on doors and have those face-to-face -face conversations, how on earth are you gonna be able to even sell somebody on the idea that you can do something outside of the duopoly? People don't know you exist. And when you try to tell people that someone else exists, they're basically like, who's this person and where'd they come from? 
So, you know, I really, I, I agree so much with what Craig said, like it has to be someone who has been doing the local work, who's been like involved in things who, you know, who people can see walking in the street and recognize them because they're always out and about in their local area. And maybe if you start there and you have a little bit of base, you know, then you can start moving forward and, and kind of growing by organics, right? Like one person knows somebody and tells somebody and tells somebody, but this idea that you're just gonna run, you don't have any backing <laughs> of one of these parties and it's gonna work, not, it's just not gonna happen. It's not, it's not possible. And part of the problem, in my opinion, is everyone wants to win now. Everybody wants to do the federal or they wanna do the presidential, they wanna do the big race now and be known now. And it's a, it's a marathon and it just hasn't been going long enough, unfortunately, for there to be some real like push and real like spread of this idea that you can win if you're not part of the duopoly. Absolutely. If I can follow on that too. So I, I, it, it, it takes a lot of time and effort, but you actually need to have a substantive website, social media, obviously be in the streets and communicating, but you also have to be willing to accept endorsements from organizations. So knock on, you know, wouldn't I appreciate, I worked very hard. I ran for council. Um, now technically three times, the first time was for the ward. Uh, our town has uh, regular council seats at large and then they have wards. So you run for that specific area. And then regretfully the gentleman passed away who was the incumbent. So there was a special runoff during the presidential year. So. In the pandemic, I'm out there trying to talk to people, you know, distanced, masked, uh, trying to gain attention. Uh, one of my campaign things was I rented an ice cream truck. And during the 2020 pandemic, you know, Howie Hawkins is trying to run for president and, and builds his left unity ticket and platform. And he came down from New York and we're sitting in an ice cream truck going around town. Sorry, I got a time sensor on my light here. All right, okay. there we go. No, oh, sorry about that. But yeah, we're in an ice cream truck just trying to gain, you know, attention to people in, in my town running for, for that special runoff. And then running at large, I noticed I've got more numbers. So it does take consistency. You have to keep running, keep committed to running. So if you're running the first time and you don't win, don't get discouraged. Run again. You're going to obviously get more votes next time and next time. So you just you keep building that name recognition and in my little town i've been told from other people to keep running and that's by republicans democrats independents unaffiliated and uh, it, it's bound to happen it's bound, you're bound to break through it's just obviously staying strong staying committed but trying to also get some endorsements i happen to be the first green to get the sierra club endorsement in new jersey and also league of conservation voters and that took a lot of time and effort. And I always tell all these candidates that are running, fill out the surveys, go on Zoom calls, join these organizations so that when you, if and when you decide to run, you can obviously say, hey, look, I'm a member. I've been involved. I'm out at this events. Now I'm running for office. So you can obviously gain a little footing that way. Those endorsements do help with name recognition as well. As Greens, I had to say I can't take any money from them because some of them are PACs. And that's another debate that we can have another time, obviously, about structure and organization. But yeah, uh, there's the whole dues prize. Do we have a, a dues-based party? Do we just do registered members? So, and what do we do about PAC? So we don't take PAC money. I always made it a point to not take PAC money. I take their endorsement. I said, I gladly can't take any money from you, but I appreciate you sharing my campaign on social media and any volunteers you can provide. If, if I might add a little bit here too. Sorry, you know. I, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Did you? No, mind? I was about to ask a question and uh, make a comment just really quick, oh, um, and then it may circle into what to what your comment is as well. If not, you know, you could go ahead and and uh, and you know add whatever you wanted to add. But I, I can go ahead and get the the question um, jumped off. One of the things that I saw because I worked almost a hundred uh, congressional and senate races, you know, combined, maybe about thirty senate races, and the rest were were house races. One of the things that I saw was some races did focus very heavily on endorsements to the point where they relied on the endorsements to carry them. They didn't do the door knocking and the movement building and the on the ground organizing. And that was actually one barrier. I think 
it's a good point to say to get endorsements. But from what I saw, that heavy focus on just endorsements and just getting press and kind of hoping that that would skate them through. I had a lot of candidates that did that, that maybe ran twice. And the second time around, they're out there knocking doors and getting the list, you know, and, and taking names and, and also taking some endorsements, but maybe spending a little bit less time on that aspect and a little bit more time on the organizing. But I do think there has to be both. That's just a little bit of a different thing that I saw with my races being so heavily focused. Like I have to get all 40 unions on my list and I have to get, you know, every single org to endorse me or there's no point when most of the voters we called for and talked to didn't know who any of those organizations were. But getting the volunteers and getting the people to help you from those orgs when they actually do, which Renee and I both know, <laughs> a lot of these organizations out there don't um, bring you anything. They just put your name out there for you a little bit. So, uh, so yeah, I, my question would be, there's a lot of misconceptions around building a third party and what that looks like. So I've heard a lot of talk from just people that are hopeful you know, that want to see the duopoly change that, you know, understand they, you know, they'll say both parties are the same. They're part of the oligarchy. They're part of the corporate machine. We need a third party tomorrow. And then we have people out there that are promising to build a third party overnight or to run a candidate in a state tomorrow that doesn't have ballot access yet. So there's a lot of misconceptions almost about what it or on what it takes to build a third party. So I was going to ask Justin about that just a little bit. And uh, maybe Renee, um, you could follow up since you work with Socialist Alternative and you're doing some of this work right now. I know that we've talked about that in the past. But what does it take to get, you know, every single state is different. Every single s secretary of state has different rules to get on the ballot access. In Texas, for instance, you have to get, what is it, 3% of the gubernatorial vote. Or, no, it's 4% now, 4% of the gubernatorial vote to get on the ballot there to be a state party. And you have to be a state party to run candidates at any level. The second part about Texas is you can do it another way. But in that way, in every district and municipality, you have to have a conference. And then all of those conferences have to combine and have another conference. And it's like a six month program that you have to do to even get ballot access. And then you're not guaranteed because the secretary of state then has to analyze all your signatures and conference to make sure every single one of them are up to code. That's just Texas. Other states, you can't even apply for ballot access. You can only do it by um, running it through a governorship. That means that it's every six years before you can apply in that state. So I know the Greens have been working on this for decades to get to the point where you have ballot access in, is it every state or nearly every state? What does that look like? And what would you tell people that have this sort of mythos that tomorrow can be a party um, and we'll be running candidates and the, the people that, you know, kind of don't understand how that works. And that's not to say I'm encouraging people to vote Democrat because it's hard to build a party. I just think people should be aware of what they're giving their money and time to and understand how these things work electorally. Okay, so <laughs> a lot there. Um, the um, First of all, you know, um, we've been talking mostly about the municipal races, which are extremely important. And, you know, state level races also that, you know, Terrence Cudney ran in for state Senate. Um, you know, we want to win seats at those levels. And it, it, so it really is important. And um, yeah, ballot access in every state is very different. And that's why I go back to saying, you know, we really need expertise in each state to know their their unique conditions, right? Um, and, you know, um, I appreciate you mentioning, you know, the, the Green Party has been at it for a while, right? Um, you know, it, it's funny, like people say, we want a third party now. Well, you already have one. We've, you know, we've been around, you know, predates me, me being part of it in 20, you know, joining in 2016, 2017. Um, you know, the main Greens was the first, um, one of the first state parties in the United States um, around the same time, like I think maybe California, Alaska, Hawaii. And, um, you know, so we have some history, you know, back, from the mid eighties, I would say, you know, and it's interesting to compare the green party to the libertarian party. Um, they've been around for about 50 years compared to the green party. That's been, really been around for 25 to 30 years. Um, 
Jill Stein, as a presidential candidate, uh, talking, you know, next level up, um, could have won 97% of the electoral college votes in 2016 and was on the ballot as a, a Green Party candidate in, um, I think, 45 states. And, um, you know, talking about ballot access in certain, some of those states, too, it's it's kind of it's kind of weird. Some some states have, you know, um, actual registered party members. Um, some states don't. Um, and um, but and, and also um, Jill was on the ballot as a write in candidate in three states. So 48 states, 97 percent of the electoral college vote. But, um, you know, I think, you know, again, we shouldn't look necessarily at like, you know, oh, let's just focus on federal level races or the presidency or just the municipal elections. Um, I think one advantage to running with uh, an actual established party is that you can work with your municipal level candidates and lower level candidates and also for um, state legislature. Um, and if you have enough candidates at that level, like if, you know, all around the state, um, and you have an up ticket race, they can work together and they should work together. Kind of like, um, you know, Craig was saying with, with how are you joining him in the ice cream truck? I mean, we should have the, those kind of up, up ticket candidates going and really supporting all those, um, you know, lower ticket races. And, um, you know, we might not win that upper ticket race, but, you know, if, if they're down kind of building enthusiasm, right, and getting re name recognition out for our um, down ticket candidates, um, that only helps, right, in spreading our values. Um, so I think we need to think synergistically about, like, you know, municipal, state level uh, races, and then working with the, the federal level races. And one thing strategically, too, about you know our ability to support candidates and resources and what what's a good use of our time you know i think it's important to look at certain races where we really have opportunities in certain states where we have opportunities um you know we have a very difficult time getting candidates at the federal level here in maine with the greens but we have ranked choice voting here um we have ranked choice voting in alaska now um for those races we have um the top two primary thing in california it's a little funny and it, it actually doesn't help us, but geez, wouldn't it be nice to have a green running? Uh, you hear talk about Katie Porter running for Senate. Uh, wouldn't it be great to have a green there in the mix, at least uh, talking about our values a little bit. So, um, you know, again, I think if we, if we look at like how our upper ticket races can support like down ticket candidates, that's where having a party apparatus can really help us out. And, you know, um, I actually tried to get the green rainbow party to help out Terrence a little bit. I'm curious to hear how that went. Um, it was kind of late in the game to try to connect um, some of the folks there with you. Um, and I don't know how many folks we actually had in the Gloucester area, but um, you know, uh, I think that's mo more where we can work together. Can I, uh, Terrence, maybe you could an answer this, but something that I've noticed in covering elections, and this isn't even about third parties versus democratic party, it's just the electorate. Something I've really noticed a lot of the time, most people don't even know there is an election coming up. Most people don't even know who their Congress, well, maybe not their congressperson, but in a lot of cases, they don't know there is a primary or when the date is or who's running. Uh, a lot of voters um, don't know who their local council person is. Most people are checked out. Like most people are not diehards or most people, maybe they would care, but they're working two, three jobs, you know, whatever, which presents an opportunity because those would be the people that might be open. I mean, I remember the two times I covered Nina Turner's election. I mean, voter Turner, voter turnout was like 17% in Cleveland. It was really low. Uh, when I covered Tim Canova for Debbie Wasserman Schultz in 2016, where they'd like destroyed the paper ballots and it was all sorts of fuckery. Um, I mean, most people had no clue there was a primary even happening. Can you kind of talk about what, I mean, that sucks. It shows voter kind of apathy, but on the other end, is that an opportunity if you're running as an independent or a third party candidate? Because there's a pool of people that if you just inform them, they might be open to you. 
Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think you hit the nail on the head that if there's there's a big difficulty of just getting the word out, not just that you are a candidate in an election, but that there is an election happening. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I mean, I think that's, that's a big part of uh, my sort of approach was I actually, as a first time candidate, you know, I was kind of flying by the seat of my pants trying to figure out how to run an election while I was running an election. And so one of the decisions I made early on, pretty controversial, probably, uh, to most people on this panel is, you know, I decided not to go door to door. I decided, you know, I, I we, it was in the middle of the pandemic still, you know, folks were uh, a little bit nervous about uh, answering their door. Um, so I decided I was just going to be in public places, um, you know, with my uh, you know, little flyers and, um, you know, just talk to people on the ground uh, as much as possible. And by the way, like that helped me get, you know, some voters that I don't think I otherwise would have gotten. I got some Trump voters to say, well, you're out here and the other guy's not. So I'm going to vote for you. Um, and, and I was like, all right, well, I'll take it. <laughs> you know, great. Um, moves the needle uh, just a little bit. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was it was uh, it was uh, <laughs> it was an interesting challenge to just kind of say, OK, I'm going to throw out the sort of conventional wisdom um, and just be in public places and, and and talk to people. And by the way, I'm really glad uh, Justin brought up, you know, we had a nice uh, conversation, um, you know, in the midst of my race about, you know, kind of moving forward third party movements uh, in, you know, the Northeast um, broadly. And, um, you know, there was a bit of a, uh, uh, we had a really just inspiring conversation. And so it's so good to be, you know, on with you again, um, Justin and, and, and talk. Um, but yeah, the, the, the fact about running a third party or independent race, well, in particular, a third party uh, race is you're, you're cajoling, you know, 50 state parties and, and thousands of local parties together. Um, and so sometimes, you know, there's a bit of a breakdown in communication and, um, you know, I, I basically one of my goals in my conversation with Justin was, you know, let's try and build some third party momentum um, in the Northeast. Like it strikes me, I, there's not a lot I agree with libertarians on, um, but it strikes me that there is a constituency for for libertarians in, in Massachusetts, you know. And, and by the way, I think there's a, a strong con contingency for, you know, leftist candidates. So whether it be Greens or, or, or what have you, you know, it'd be really nice to have a, a party to go to. Um, and yeah, I don't want to open any wounds, you know, uh, but I, I struggled with uh, sort of uh, going from a very positive conversation with Justin, with with the, the main greens um, to sort of struggling and, and floundering with, you know, how to collaborate uh, with the, the Massachusetts Green Rainbow Party. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of challenges there. I'm not sure if I answered all of your question there, Jordan, but uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think a huge part of the battle is just most voters don't most People don't vote or, and aren't involved. Uh, the biggest party in America is non-voters uh, for a variety of reasons. So uh, whether that is third party, independent, I mean, whoever could figure that out uh, <laughs> is the winner. Uh, Jordan, Craig, yeah. that actually, that leads me real quick to the next to the next question I was going to ask, if that's yeah. okay. It's real quick, of, if you don't, Zaina, yeah, just, just because you, you mentioned socialist alternative, and I want to make sure that people understand the socialist alternative is not a political party, right? Like, um, as as much as Shama Sawant has gotten done in Seattle, she ran as an independent. She is a member of Socialist Alternative. She, you know, felt deeply that she was responsible to the organization to make sure that she was holding to the things that she was supposed to hold to, which which she's done. Um, you know, as you brought, I, I don't know how many people know that she's not running again. You know, she's starting a whole different organization, um, you know, for workers' rights and to try and help people organize in their workspace. Um, but I, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear because I know sometimes people think Socialist Alternative is a political party and it's not. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Renee. Uh, I, uh, so the question that I have is um, around, I saw a lot of chatter in the chat about not saying positives. Well, on the shows all the time, we talk about things that 
our possibilities running local running state and and jordan and i even have some back and forth on this often but one of the things is something that i mentioned early on in the show and that is that 70 percent of americans that are registered are registered independent and like jordan just said a moment ago that's only a fraction of the potential voters right like there's a whole gen z opportunity to register gen z um who most of them identify as as left you know, of the of the spectrum of the political spectrum, you have a lot of millennials that haven't registered to vote. So there's opportunity in, you know, the youth um, right now in the country and getting them registered, getting them mobilized. And I know I was going to start with Renee and then I would love to hear from, you know, Craig or whoever else would like to jump in. But um you often talk about, Renee, using actions and organizing as a way to also get people registered to vote, um, particularly, you know, registered in third parties or independent. We do have, speaking of the opportunities, there's a great opportunity, just as we said at the beginning of the show, 80 percent of independents don't want Biden. So with that being said, that's the majority of the country. Only 20 percent are Democrats. Only 20 percent are registered Republicans. If that, in a lot of states, it's even lower. So with the majority being independent, how do you reach those people and, um, you know, also get people registered, kind of get them politically involved in the first place so that they would even be electorally aware? As Jordan said, most people don't even know when election season is or who's running or <laughs> what's going on. So uh, how, how do you suggest kind of using action and organizing for people to be able to build those? Because I know that that's something that you're passionate about. I mean, the, the reality is you have to talk to people, right? You have to have conversations with real people about what's going on. And a big reason that, you know, in my the conversations that I've had with people who do not vote, the reason people don't take the time to go out and vote is because they don't have any faith that going into a little booth and check marking or or circling in or whatever you do at your polling place is gonna make a difference for their material conditions. So when you have someone who is working two jobs, who has kids and you know uh, rent that has to be paid, like the idea that they have time to like sit back and really contemplate all these things can be almost impossible. Like people are trying to survive, right? They're trying to get day to day, get through their life, make sure they get their paycheck, make sure the rent's paid, make sure they have food on the table. It's a long, it's a big ask to, to, to really try and get somebody to step back from all of those things in order to find a reason to go out and do something different. But that also is the problem, right? Is because people are so disengaged and people are so disgusted with the system that they bow out. I feel like that's intentional. My personal belief is the system has created this feeling within the majority of people that their vote doesn't matter and it doesn't matter what they do in the polls and therefore why are they going to bother. And by doing that, they created a huge portion of the population who has given up on this electoral process. And it's not that it's wrong to give up on the electoral process. It's not that, you know, it's this crazy idea that people bow out because they're sick of it. But the problem is you've now left the control of the vote in the hands of the people who you least want to have that level of control. So the reason I talk a lot about organizing and having conversations and doing all those things is because how else are you going to reach people? One of the things that, you know, that I haven't really been able to do as much of it with Socialist Alternative because I moved is they table all the time. Like Socialist Alternative is out in Brooklyn, in New York, in the city. They're all over the place tabling and just having conversations with people who are walking by to try and encourage them to engage in the current news of what's happening right now. Like what is the thing that's affecting people right now? Because the goal has to be to change the consciousness of the people who are walking by. The goal has to be to turn people on to paying attention to what is happening so that they have even a shot of having that conversation when it's time to go out and vote for somebody. One of the biggest mistakes I think people make is they wait until it's a voting cycle to start having conversations with people. So now 
you're like pressed, right? You're trying to make sure that you can get to enough people, that you can get enough signatures, that you can get enough whatever it is that you need in that moment so that you can move forward in this particular cycle. And off cycle, there is a ton of time that could be used to organize, to have conversations, to deal with people, to understand like what people need in your community right now now that you can actually participate in that when it's time for you to go back to them and have the conversation about possibly voting you're not just going back to them to vote nobody wants to have that conversation you didn't care about not paying rent you didn't care about the price of eggs you didn't care about not being able to you know pay your child care there's so many other things that people are dealing with like this idea that you're just going to circle back when it's time to get on the ballot line people don't want to hear that like they're over it by then Absolutely. Um, hey, Craig, I wanted to ask you, uh, I don't know if this opens up a can of worms, but I was kind of thinking if I'm somebody who has run as a Green Party candidate and over the last two years, we're seeing all this enthusiasm from former like Bernie people, you know, disenchanted uh, people who were at one point doing it within the Democratic Party. If there's all this enthusiasm for a third party, I've kind of thought to myself, well, you know, if why try and reinvent the wheel you, as a green? Is there any thoughts on why are all these people trying to create MPP and uh, other third parties rather than the Green Party has already had ballot access, at least on the presidential level in the majority of the states? Sure, there's been issues and corruption and, you know, other things. But at the end of the day, it is the uh the best third party in terms of ballot access infrastructure. Um, I've seen some disorganization too, but is there any thoughts, Justin and Craig, as far as why don't people just try and get involved in the green party, take that to the next level rather than trying to create several other parties, Craig, you, you've, you haven't talked as much. That, thanks Jordan for the question. And that was part of um, why I joined the green party in here in New Jersey. Uh, we, after 2016, let's let's just say right now, Jill Stein ran an amazing campaign, riding the coattails of all the fervor and energy that was going on through the Democratic primary process. And then obviously when Bernie bowed out, a lot of people were like, what do we go? What do we do next? What's the next best option? And the, a lot of people weren't aware, and even now are still not aware of the Green Party platform and what we've been supporting for over a decade uh, between Medicare for All and our platform, reparations, uh, Obviously, Justin will tell me more things that I might be leaving out, but we went from a state party of having under 3,000 registered Greens in the beginning of 17. We had a great gubernatorial candidate ran in 2017, South, South Copperdale, and then we started to build, and now we're standing at 11,669 registered Greens. But yeah, there's 2.3 million unaffiliated voters in New Jersey. How do we tap that energy? And it's really still tough when you're dealing through a pandemic. And I'll be honest, the pandemic made really all the organizing efforts we did and the, the progress we made was literally almost killed or nearly killed off because we were able to still have in-person conventions. And I got to meet people like obviously Jill and Howie and Kashama Sawant came to a couple of our uh, national meetings. And we were able to feed off the energy and, and talk, but Zoom is great, but it's not great for organizing as well as you think. And I think that we're still working to get the energy and get everybody back together to go out there. Um, but yeah, what I tell everybody is, look, the Green Party is got the best platform if you read it. Uh, basically think of it as you can mold it the way you want. If you wanna work on local issues, actions, great. I'm totally for attending any action. I'm always for a general strike. And I think that's the thing. You need to have, though, the electoral end of it. So that you have to balance them both out. It's great to have all these actions and energy for actions, but you also have to have people that are willing to run for local, state, and obviously federal races to try to balance it all out. I, I still think that it's the it's the best vehicle to, if, if anybody wants to co-opt and take over, please come over, <laughs> take over the Green Party. Uh, we welcome you with open arms because it, it does get tiring and exhausting trying to, to organize a political party. As obviously, everybody else that's been involved in organizing some capacity knows that it's eventually going to drain. Uh, and I'll be honest, I'm not looking forward to hearing people talk about the Andrew Yang and the Forward Party. Let, let's be real. There is some Forward people in New Jersey that have been organizing. Some are friends in other orgs. But 
Forward Party originally was supporting cryptocurrency. Uh, thankfully, Food and Water Watch actually was working in New York to stop uh, a power plant being used for crypto mining. And if you're an environmental activist, you are not going to be into cryptocurrency. It's really detrimental to the environment, especially with the way energy prices and things are these days. Also, they're getting in bed with a lot of moderate to centrist, even Republicans like Christy Todd Whitman. And I don't know if you knew this. Christy Todd Whitman is, is a very dangerous governor. She actually was dipping into just the pension. So, uh, credit just, so, the just, so the audience, just so the audience knows, she was the governor of New Jersey, right? Correct. And she right. was dipping into the pension, trying to balance the budget out, almost blew all the state workers' pension funds. And then when she was in the, uh, she also had a, a photo where she had frisked, like stopped and frisked somebody. And it was just very bad PR. And uh, when she went to the EPA, she was the one that basically said after a week after 9-11 that the air is clear, you can come back. And, and then obviously 15 years later, regret saying that because that exposed people to having a lot of lung issues and cancer and things like that. So this is not somebody that you want to rally around. And it just scares me seeing a lot of people organizing with that, that, that with Yang on that, on that level. And yes, we'll talk about a little bit MPP. I have not been an MPP fan, but I was involved because I'm always keep one arm open and one hand open to try to work with things. This was back in like 2017, 2018. But seeing that there was no effort to cross endorse candidates that were running for office, and that was my beef in 2018 with the organizers there is, hey, look, you're not ready to run your own candidates, then why don't you endorse some of the ones that are running? Put your logo on our campaigns. If they win, they win, If they and you get the credit. If they don't win, great, you at least tried and say you tried to get behind together and have some sort of coalition. Uh, I still think the energy, everybody's energy is valuable and their time is, is even more valuable. And I just don't like people being spun around constantly when we could definitely work together to build in the Green Party. And despite what people might think about Howie Hawkins today, when he was trying to run his campaign under left unity for president, it was a great message. He was really out there reaching out to Social Alternative, uh, some local DSA chapters. He got endorsements from some other parties. Obviously, he, he reached out to Angela Walker to be his VP and uh, combine the Socialist Party with the Greens on that run. That's what we need. That's the type of energy we need. You know, some people can sit there and say that he might have been the most charismatic person, but, but he is politically sound and can speak and hold the message and hold everybody accountable to the issue. And that's the thing. You need to have a serious candidate that has that runs on issues and is going to be there for the working class. And I think that's what we have to look at this day and age is any political party we're going to spend your energy and time has to be for the working class. And just so people, just so people who don't know when they say MPP uh, movement for a people's party, which started as draft Bernie um, and then kind of shifted into we won't get into what it shifted into, but it, it was an attempt as a third party. Um, I think there's still some people involved. Uh, Zaina was the executive director. Um, but yeah, I mean, Justin, real quick, uh, let me ask you the same question. I, I, my mentality, let's have a fourth party, a fifth party, a sixth party. But to get that first, third one that's competing, why try to reinvent the wheel rather than just, you know, make the Green Party better? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there really is value to to take, you know, what is existing, right? If if you want to elect a, you know, a candidate in the near future, right? If you want to see gains in the near future, um, you know, to start from scratch is extremely difficult. I mean, some people don't even know the rules of like creating a, a new party in the state, um, their state. So, um, you know, and you know, I want to talk. Kind of go back to this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier and people's involvement you know getting them excited about you know not even knowing about elections right as renee pointed out you know people are struggling to keep food on the table they don't have time usually to get involved unless you know there there are various reasons why people do make time in their lives to be participate in uh, politics but you know the green party is a working class party right and um you know, so we're all working our day jobs and, you know, doing what we can with the Green Party um, outside of that. But, you know, most Americans, most people, you know, they don't get in, interested in the, the details of the parties, right? They just vote for candidates. And they, 
typically don't get involved with party primaries. Uh, it depends on what state you're in and what the, the makeup is like, how much people pay attention. But, um, you know, where people really turn out are the general elections. And that's, you know, something I stress with the Green Party, where, um, you know, geez, you know, Bernie Sanders was blocked from being the Democratic Party nominee and the, sorry, the true leftist nominee in 2016, right? Um, but wasn't it a good thing that folks that I didn't really know about in the Green Party were really pushing Jill Stein and got her on the ballot in 48 states? If they hadn't done that, I wouldn't have had anybody to vote for in 2016. Um, so, you know, it's, I think, you know, people pay attention more in the general elections. So skipping the Democratic Party primaries, I mean, with Nina, for instance, in Ohio, um, you know, and Jordan, you, you did tremendous work with her campaign. And, um, you know, so you, I really appreciate it, you know, as a as a journalist, but also really getting your boots on the ground and, and being embedded in this kind of stuff. The, um, you know, it's, um, I always recommend, hey, why participate in a rigged Dem primary system? You know, because I, I knew it was going to happen to Nina, too, because I saw it happen to Dennis Kucinich two years before. Right. Um, same exact kind of thing. And um, so I say skip the primaries. You know, at, running as an independent, you don't have primaries. But again, you don't have a party infrastructure helping you out run your race. Um, and um, but, you know, skip the primaries with the, you know, the Dem party primaries and run as a green. And um, you're actually a candidate that people can vote for in the general election where people pay more attention, right? The, those people that are usually working the day jobs, they do pay attention a little bit. And they, you know, a lot of times people want you to reach out to them during the election cycle your can as a candidate. They want you to knock on their door. They want you to give them a phone call and tell them about them. That means a lot to them that you've reached out. Um, so, and another thing that Renee brought up too that I wanna mention here, getting people engaged with the parties and stuff. And again, it's different in every state, you know, what it means to be a party member and stuff like that. In Maine, we're a registration state and we have 40,000 registered Greens in, in out of a million voters in Maine, um, which is pretty decent. But, um, you know, it's, um, I think there's, there is tons of merit to not only, you know, again, look, running both at the local, state and um, federal levels, but also building our five candidates from, you know, again, being active in their, their local uh, city or town uh, council, or um, um, being on certain committees, um, actually being activists in the streets. I'd love to see more um, activism leading to candidates really pushing home that, that message or those demands, right? Bringing those demands into the electoral arena and really putting pressure, more pressure on the Democrat Republicans that are running and Democrats and Republicans are running. So I think there's a lot of value. And again, generals are where it's at. That's where people actually pay attention. They want to hear from candidates. They want to get more, a little bit more involved then. Um, but in primaries or trying to educate them on what a primary election is, forget about it. You know, people are too busy trying to survive these days. Absolutely. Zaina, you wanted to jump in? Yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, I talked to a lot of candidates running last in last cycle. You know, I was trying to help some green candidates uh, and some independents. That's how I reached out to Terrence in the first place. Like, hey, need any help? Um, <laughs> but uh, the thing that one of the things that struck out to me is I talked to people that were like, uh, this wasn't Terrence. And, uh, you know, <laughs> but there were people out there that I talked to that were like, I'm not going to knock doors. I think that that's wrong. You know, knocking doors. I don't want to bother people. And then I talked to some Greens that were like, I don't want to raise money. I feel like it's exploitative to raise money. I also talked to folks that were like, we don't even have staffing at the national level. Staffing is um, immoral, basically arguing that if you pay people to do the work that they're doing, like, I believe that if you're working in an infrastructure that we should pay our volunteers for their time, if you can get to the point to pay them for the work that they're putting in, like people that have been volunteering, if you can build it to where you're paying them a living wage for the hours they're putting in, and they want to volunteer extra, great. But, you know, people should be, 
you know, people should be able to have a living wage if they're working 60 hours a week trying to build a movement. So my question is, you know, has the Green Party addressed that? You know, how do you kind of I see those as barriers, understanding how elections go. If you can't like, you know, have some folks that, you know, you can ha ask for more time, especially and you can't get poor people involved and black and brown people involved and people that don't have the time as easily to get involved if there's not a pay structure. Renee and I've talked about this a lot. If you don't, you know, incentivize it through being able to say, OK, you can quit work and you can come here and do this and be involved and be engaged. So what's the plan sort of around the Green Party, you know, just just briefly, because uh, we're going to move on to talking about the presidential, but just very briefly, like what would be your plan to get to that point where you can, you know, have a staff that can help grow and you can have, you know, maybe even paid canvassers or door knockers. This is I'm not talking about corporate money. I'm talking about people funded. But how is is there a plan for that or a goal for that in the future? And and how are you going to kind of set up an infrastructure where you train candidates about these important aspects when running? Um, Craig, do you want to jump on that or, uh, you know, I sure, was real asking quick. Justin, but if, if Craig, real might, quick, I'll I know just say, you were co-chair, so I thought you might you might have a little bit, you know, of knowledge on on those plans. Well, um, and, you know, Craig's a co-chair in New Jersey, too. So, okay. yeah, I mean different perspectives but um correct you want to state level is definitely different for sure obviously if the candidate and campaign is raising enough money like in 2017 our gubernatorial candidate did have enough money to have a paid staff and he was paying uh more than a minimum wage in 2017 uh for his staff um but a lot of local races it's really going to be volunteer based because there is no salary there's no you're you're not even getting two to three thousand maybe four thousand dollars just for like stationary and stuff so a lot of the local races is going to be tough it is going to be basically just enough to fundraise to to, to print your materials you need to try to win and a, a local race you probably need to fundraise maybe twenty five hundred dollars maybe five thousand to be competitive you really don't need more than that uh on a local level but yes on statewide uh, you're going to need a lot more. And New Jersey, the barrier to be in the debates was so ridiculous. I think in 2017, it was like $380,000 to get on the debate stage. And then they like almost raised another 100, 120,000, uh, the last gubernatorial race. And that would make the barrier really hard for any Green Party candidate to make that unless they attend and show up to every action and every event. So yes, it's a, it's a very heavily volunteer based and it, obviously, if a candidate's breaking ground and, and taking you know, gangbusters like a Matthew Ho recently, then you're able to like pay a staff, of course. And, you know, um, that's a really good point, too, Craig. Um, you know, it's not so much the, the local um, chapter or the state uh, party that where there's a lot of money that we can generate. It's it's, you know. The big ticket are the candidates races, right, where they can bring in a lot of money, a lot of excitement and, again, pay their people, um, you know, and, you know, one one thing to do is to say, hey, you know, if, if we're focusing on these candidates, you know, can we, you know, they're going to go out and work on those campaigns and hopefully get some income that way. Um, so, I mean, candidates are where the money comes in and, you know. You know, talk about growing party and also bringing funds into the party, right? And um, getting people to donate on a regular basis. You know, I think if if we had a mass movement into the Green Party, you know, we we'd have more funds available to these state parties, and um, you know, not just the candidates, right? But um, like, you know, how do you get that excitement? I mean, look at how much people donated to Bernie Sanders. You know, how much money was donated to him, and um, if Bernie had jumped ship and actually got on the ticket with Jill Stein in 2016, which, you know, she offered to him, um, you know, the um, I mean, the, it would be a different Green Party today, of course. Right. Uh, all these people are going to, you know, follow Bernie directly. in, Right. Um, and um, but, you know, there's a. a something to be said about, you know, getting well-known people running for office, hopefully, you know, and, you know, if they're in line with our values, um, you know, somebody I look to in New Jersey, for instance, um, who actually 
considered running in 2020 for United States representative, I believe. And you could back me up on this, Craig, if you know the inside scoop. But Chris Hedges was looking at running in 2020. He could have brought in tons of donations, um, not in members to the party, um, got in, um, you know, uh, had a very well paid staff, I'm sure. They, um, he would have been fundraising from people all over the country for that race, right? Put a lot of excitement and energy because he's so well known in the left. Um, so, you know, as far as like making it something where, you know, people can actually get paid for their time, it's it's a tough answer. You know, really, again, it's during the um, during the election cycles where, you know, you really do have that chance to, you know, on the larger campaigns. Um, and as Craig was saying, you know, you don't need as much for the local races. And really, it's, you know, maybe just the candidate doing all the door knocking and stuff like that. You don't have surrogates and, you know, it. It can be a, a one person show running the campaign, um, you know, and geez, uh, in Maine, we have clean elections for our um, state legislative races. Right. Which really helps, um, you know, where you basically get so many five dollar donations and you get like this lump sum of like, you know, um, eight thousand dollars that you can run on your campaign. You know, if you get like sixty five dollar donations, clean elections are great, you know, and that's you know, as we're running for office, we should be pushing for clean elections and ranked choice voting and things like that, right? Um, these other things, and also local issues. Um, so for that, uh, I just want to do a, I just want to do a quick question before we move to the presidential, because I know I don't want to keep you guys till, you know, midnight. But um, I want to ask you all, because I think a big part of succeeding, period, uh, the media, in many cases, can decide an election, whether you're running in the Dem Party, Independent, Green Party. You got either a media blackout where they won't even acknowledge your existence or they do acknowledge your existence with a lot of mudslinging and smears and propaganda. Um, I don't know which one is worse, <laughs> uh, but um, a lot of people we're talking about how many people don't even know there's an election. A lot of people that do vote, they'll start paying attention maybe the week before. And the only thing they'll see is the television ads, um, maybe some stuff on YouTube, but really their media exposure is the TV ads, which obviously is a lot of mudslinging and propaganda. Um, and that's it. Can you kind of talk about uh, Terrence, you ran as an independent. I mean, it's an uphill climb to get local media to cover you if you're running as an independent or third party. And frankly, for all the, you know, other independent YouTube channels who like to um, talk about how pure they are uh, and we should not run as Democrats and only run third party. I've asked a lot of third party candidates. Have you gotten any answers when you've pitched certain shows? They can't get on those shows either. Uh, so can you kind of talk about challenges and just getting media coverage uh, and getting awareness to your candidacy? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, I think local media is really important, um, including newspapers. I think people underestimate, uh, you know, the power of uh, getting in front of uh, people in print. Um, so, you know, to, to the one of the uh, comments that's been made uh, a couple times about timing, you know, the fact is, yeah, getting uh, if you get in the media about a year out, that's probably too far out um, for, for a lot of voters like they will forget you by the time that uh, the election uh comes around. So in my effort to, you know, kind of avoid the the spoiler effect, you know, I tried to, I got my press release out early and got uh, featured at the uh, front page of the Gloucester Daily Times, my local paper, um, literally a year out before the election, which is great. You know, I got, you know, uh, a number of people interested in, in the, the campaign and, you know, to uh, another point about, you know, sort of mobilizing, you know, was able to get involved in some local organizations for, uh, affordable housing and for, um, you know, sexual violence. I'm a survivor of uh, chronic sexual assault. Um, you know, so all this stuff is, you know, very important uh, and, and, and just getting involved, uh, getting connected to the media is very important. So I was fortunate enough um, later on to get uh, connected to uh, League of Women Voters, the local uh, chapter. They're all about, you know, sort of supporting um, candidates, just supporting real democracy, you know, in, in a sense. Um, and so I was able to get back in the paper that way and also to get in front of the, the local uh, TV network and was able to do a uh, sort of TV spot. You know, it sh showed up on the local TV channel. 
um, you know, a couple times. And uh, that was great. That was a great way to get um, out there. And by the way, also, you know, op-eds, you know, getting folks to um, write into the paper on behalf of your candidacy. That actually, my best performance uh, in the uh, election by, you know, mis municipality was actually Newburyport, which is basically an hour, 45 minutes to an hour north of where I live. Um, you know, basically that, that turned around my, my campaign, uh, locally was just getting, you know, I knocked on a couple doors there trying to get my lawn signs out on public property and on private property. And, uh, you know, basically that, uh, that was by far my best performance, almost, uh, almost beat the incumbent in that, in that area. Um, so, you know, it's tricky. Um, you know, people do not want to, uh, you know, disrupt the duopoly and to the point that's been said, you know, a lot, um, you know. Yeah, it's just it's it's hard to get out there when you're an independent candidate. People will shut you out, um, you know, of uh, campaigns. It's hard to get on the campaign. Uh, sorry, hard to get on the debate stage um, with folks. You know, I made my effort. Um, turns out, if I if I'd reached out a little bit earlier, um, you know, I might have. I made the mistake. This is a bit in the weeds. I made the mistake of reaching out to the League of Women Voters state chapter, ch state chapter rather than the local chapter. The local chapter was very interested in you know getting me out there. And so if I'd reached out a little earlier, maybe I could have pressured the other candidates to be on uh, a debate stage with me, um, which would have been great. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard. And, and, and I have had actually a pretty decent uh, track record with, with independent media, you know, um, just folks inviting me on, folks hearing about me. Uh, Renee actually connected me to a, a couple people. Um, so, you know, it's tricky out there. But like, like we've said, by the way, I just want to say, you know, there are advantages, you know, to running independent and running third party, you know, uh, I think Justin sort of alluded to it, you know, you, um, you have less to worry about in the primary, um, running as an independent, you know, you don't have a primary. Uh, so you're all the way through to the general. And that means you can start, you know, mobilizing building uh, energy, you know, earlier on and just uh, getting people engaged. Um, so yeah, I, I'm so glad that uh, this this panel happened and um, that uh, we're engaging on, especially on the local and sort of legislative district level. There's a lot um, that can be accomplished there. Um, so, absolutely. Um, um, I want to apologize if I cut out here. Um, I, I'm very low on battery and I don't have it plugged in. So if I drop mysteriously, I'd love to come back and talk about presidential politics with you, George, sometime. Um, but, um, about, well, sorry. Uh, hopefully your battery comes back. Uh, let's give people the popcorn. <laughs> let's give people the popcorn they want. Let's move on to the presidential. And uh, yeah, we'll have to have everybody everybody back because there's a lot more to talk about. Uh, but obviously, um, people uh, on the YouTube are focused on the presidential politics. We started the live stream talking about, I mean, Biden is weak. And frankly, if in 2020, Donald Trump had not handled COVID like a fucking moron, um, he might still be president. Um, and frankly, if the Supreme Court did not overturn Roe v. Wade, uh, it probably would have been a Republican tidal wave in the midterms. Uh, that seems to be uh, how Democrats um, say, you know, uh, obviously they lost the House, but kept, kept the Senate and performed a lot better than most people thought. So I would say uh, Biden is a weak incumbent. He's also, what is he, 80? Uh, clearly, not in his prime. Uh, and his vice president, uh, the New York Times, just did a piece basically talking about how even her advocates think she's way not ready for prime, not not doing a good job. Let's put it that way. Um, so my mentality is I'm for a third party. Uh, I don't personally think the two are mutually exclusive. I mean, I don't really care if Marianne Williamson runs as a Democrat. That doesn't preclude somebody else running third party. I mean, maybe I'm being naive, but I, I think, um, you, you know, people have to do it the way they want to do it. Uh, but to me, uh, I think it, it's not as much about whether you're running as a Democrat in the primary or third party. It's about how are you running? Because I think Trump, despite his bullshit and bluster, really seized on something in 2016. And that is uh, he called it like it was. He was full of shit. But he called them corrupt. <laughs> uh, he called out the donors. He called out the B Wall Street. He called out, uh, you know, we're fighting these wars for oil. And that was a very popular thing in the Republican Party. I actually think it's wrong uh, for people to say, well, that wouldn't be popular running as a Democrat to be that that cutthroat. Um, 
or running as a third party. Uh, I, when I interviewed Marianne Williamson, I, I tried to give her the opportunity to, I think, correct the mistakes of Bernie and just call him what he is, corrupt, point out the donors. Uh, she would not do that. Uh, so in my view, I'm totally, I'm not, I mean, it's, it's not for me to tell people what to do, but I'm totally for someone running as a third party. I just wanted, which I think this panel has done a really good job of pumping the brakes at the fairy dust that, oh, if the right candidate runs his third party, you will you know, we could win. It would be a real historic uphill climb for a third party candidate to run for the presidency and, and win right now in America. That doesn't mean don't do it. But I, I just that is my belief that it would be Can very, I ask very difficult. That? Go ahead. Really quick. One of the biggest barriers for any candidate, all the candidates I help, the Senate candidates, the the congressional candidates, whether it be presidential, is starting from the point, and, and this is just push, push back just a little bit, but when we start from the point of that it's an impossibility, people want to vote for who wins. So when the media tells them that they can't win and that it's an uphill battle and that it's an impossibility or it's not going to be likely or they're only going to get three percent of the vote that's literally the cycle because i've talked to thirty thousand voters i have talked to 30 probably more than that but thirty thousand is how much i tracked on my spreadsheet right <laughs> i know that's dorky but i i tracked how many i talked to how many were democrat how many were republican how many were independent and then where they fell on things because i was doing some research but the what stuck out to me is that one of the one of the biggest barriers was with the people that were voting partisan politics or the people that were independent where they're like, we heard your candidate doesn't have a chance to win. And I only vote for winning candidates. The media is saying they don't have a chance to win. They can't get anywhere. So when the press tells people that they can't win, the press sits the stage. One of the biggest things that the press said about my candidates when they ran from the very onset was this isn't a viable campaign. Well, hell, they had just as much infrastructure as the Dem candidate did. Some of my candidates were outpacing them in donations and volunteers and groundwork and infrastructure. And the press would still say this isn't a viable campaign. So when we have that juxtaposition at the presidential level, too, I think that that's a big that's honestly one of the biggest parts of the problems. People got behind Bernie because he was a registered independent in Vermont. That's why he blew up. People thought he was independent. So I feel like we are at a zeitgeist right now where there's 70 percent are independent voters, 70 to you know 80 percent of the country to have someone come out and take that mantle and pull organizations, pull people, pull in around them in order to build up resources and build a campaign outside of the duopoly. But in order to do that, we also have to be able to give them the bandwidth and say it's a possibility. If we never say it's a possibility, it's not going to happen because people are listening to these pundits. They're listening to the media. Tell them, vote for who wins. It doesn't matter what their policies are. Vote for the winning candidate. It's like playing sports. So that's what it boils down to at the end of the day a lot. But yeah, by the way, by the way, to be clear. I, but I had to. <laughs> to be clear. To be clear. No, I'm glad you called me out on it. I'm not saying it's an impossibility. I actually think in 2016 when Bernie dropped out, I actually think he had a chance uh, if he would have ran as a Green Party candidate uh, because you had two historically unpopular candidates and obviously you had a moment, which was the Bernie movement. So I think Bernie did have a chance um, if he would have ran in the Green Party or independent, maybe. Uh, so it's definitely not an impossibility. I was just saying I, I don't like these people who just say, well, just run third party. And, you know, most people are independent and you'll have a chance. It would be a very uphill climb. But I think you're right. I mean, it's not an impossibility at all. Um, yeah, let's whoever wants to start first on, on their thoughts. Well, yeah, my my phone's probably going to die very soon. So this might be the last thing I say here. But uh, <laughs> thanks for having me on. And again, for the invite, um, you know, when the question of viability comes up, um, I, I point out the fact that Jill Stein's campaign in 2016 was far more viable than the Bernie Sanders campaign because she was actually a candidate in the general election and could have won the election. Bernie never had a chance in, in the Democratic Party primaries, right? Um, it was rigged. I mean, what, we could debate, you know, how rigged the Democratic Party primaries are. But, you know, at the end of the day, if you're not a candidate in the general election, you have no viability. 
Um, so the Green Party and it running as an independent, too, you're a far more viable candidate if you're in the general election. You know, you can't win in a race that you're not in if you can't even get to the starting line. That's a good point. I would just right, push back. On, I, I would just push back on that. Uh, Greg Pallast, Greg Pallast, who I think is a great independent journalist, makes a great he has a great line. They can't rig it all the time. So in 2020, for example, and some people have different opinions about this, um, Bernie Sanders in the Democratic primary history, the person who won Iowa, New Hampshire, who won the first three contests had always won the nomination. So obviously we know what happened uh, in terms of Obama getting in and telling everybody to drop out this and that. I think Bernie's campaign and Bernie himself had a lot of self-inflicted wounds, but that, he was a lot closer in 2020. I think he, I think he ended up um, making fatal mistakes that lost it for him. I don't think it was because they, I mean, they did rig it, but my point is Bernie could have won, in my opinion, if not for mistakes he made. So to say it, it never could happen inside the Democratic primary, I don't think is necessarily true because I think Bernie did have a shot in 2020. Um, if you would have said in 2014 that an actual progressive would win the Iowa caucus, sorry, Pete Buttigieg, Bernie, Bernie won the Iowa caucus, uh, won New Hampshire, kicked ass in Nevada. Let's not forget they had to, they ran like 20 candidates at one point in the Democratic primary in 2020. Um, so I, I, you know, I know it's a popular thought, but I don't agree that it's so rigged that no matter what, a progressive could not win the Democratic primary. But but uh, he's right. Uh, obviously, Justin uh, lost battery. If you're not in the general election, you have no shot. So anyway, anyone else? So just to follow on Justin, um, and again, I was a Bernie supporter, and I would love for Bernie to move the movement along with us to the Green Party. Uh, trying to correct the record, though, I know Jill had floated the idea Bernie could not technically have gotten the nomination because of the way things work, but he could have been her Veep and VP candidate. And also a lot of states have sore loser laws. Like if you lose a primary, you can't appear on the ballot in the same race for the same position. So, you know, and I, and I hear this now with the, the, the floating of Marion Williamson, not on this outlet, other outlets have said, well, if Marion Williamson runs and then she decides to do a dirty break, she can run as a green or whatever, you, you can't in the same cycle. It would have to be a different cycle or obviously maybe as a VP of the other party's candidate. So just to kind of correct the record there, because just, I've to, had just, 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 to, just so we can make sure people understand, is that a Green Party rule or is that like a federal election commission? No, rule? federal election law. Like when you're going okay. to put petition for office and you're on a primary ballot petition, you're signing a pledge that you're running for that seat and that seat only. And you only have one opportunity for that. And that's, I think, about 46 or 47 states. That you have to sign, and you can't then run it's to that same thing. Thirty-six right, right now, Craig. In the general, I'm sorry. Thirty thirty-six have have a spoiler pledge. Thirty-six states currently, so it's That's really prevalent. States. But it's especially prevalent in like the southern states um, with this. So places like Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, because people, you know, I even said to Paula, "Run independent if you know you lose the primary." But we did the research and you can't. It's not an option. Mm -hmm. Once you make it to the primary, you can't. But I, I believe it's 36 states total that have across the board. The secretary of state has spoiler laws. You can't but, once you run in the primary, you can't just like you said, uh, you can't run in the general as anything else. So when you file a presidential petition, you have people that sign on as your electors. And basically those people are boxed in under that candidate too. So it's not like you can then hurry and, and file another petition and gather all the signatures because a lot of the petitions are due the same day that the primary in that state is actually held. So it's not like you can quickly redo stuff. So that's why I, I've been saying, and I've been in a lot of stuff trying to correct the record there, but yes, it would have been great to have the movement come over totally, but that's why I had always said, hey, look, you come over on your own terms. One hand, I've been building and organizing the Green Party. On the other hand, I'm still always making outreach and keep my contacts in the Democratic Party. And hopefully after they've run or they got exhausted, that they'll move on over as well. But media is crucial. 2016, Jill Stein was on CNN and she had the most hits ever. And the Green Party website went crazy because nobody even knew what a Green Party was. Her and Ajamu Baraka. And then she was on uh, Fox News also, never on C uh, MSNBC. 2020 rolls around. 
I, nobody covered Howie Hawkins. You know, it was a real media blackout. And because he was really trying to push this whole left unity candidate can campaign. Excuse and me. I, I think, excuse me. I interviewed Howie Hawkins, but I'll, I'm I'll sorry. Not total <laughs> blackout, but near, near total blackout. I, I correct myself. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. And now going forward. Yeah. We need to have, you know, the record straight where I look, Mary Wilson is a nice person. I get it. They need to have somebody try to run in the primary process. That's fine. If you're going to donate 20 bucks to her, just keep another 20 bucks for your, if there's a green or somebody else that's running. And I think it's just, you know, the point has got to be made. You can't just dirty break and run in the same race for, for the same position. Um, but yeah, I, I think that we need to definitely work together, have, keep that, that left unity kind of me uh, message going forward. Whoever is going to be the, the banner, uh, the bannerman or banner woman that runs this uh, cycle. And obviously there's a lot of unknowns still. And I am, going to say this and rank choice voting is very key i'm involved with uh, an organization in new jersey i was one of the co-founding members and we're trying to get that through but you know a lot of the state parties were concerned there's some little break factions in the greens are like oh maybe a uh, jesse ventura or somebody else what we need to do is we need to obviously if anybody wants to run especially alternative or third party they have to announce early because look at all the the, the, the cards against them you would need to really get about a year year and a half advance notice and i know that's why marianne's announcing now for the democratic primary you if you're going to run and you want to run alternative you actually must got to start your exploratory now too because you've got to build that base you have to build that support and that outreach and i think that's one of those messages that is kind of lost out there that uh, there is a process to be a green nominee you have to obviously um, be able to get a certain amount of donations and certain amount of states so that you can appear some of the tightening where I thought that the Green Party nationally might have to make, and that's why I'm willing to join that committee to try to fix some of those laws, is you have to have a treasurer that can understand FEC laws because the last two cycles, both of our candidates have the FEC coming after them because of the uh, donations that they've earned and basically matching funds that they've earned. And that's another hurdle that the government's going to try to come after you for the money that you've legally earned in your uh, in your process to run for office. So there's a lot of little things that we've got to work on in minutia now, but uh, we're definitely open to hearing suggestions and candidates and we're floating people out there now too. And, uh, and the movement's going to keep moving forward. So I'm definitely there to support any way I can. And uh, I have to uh, dirty break myself because I got to go to my newborn. So Zaina's going to keep this going. But I just want to wrap up in a minute. Yeah. I just want to make one comment, Craig. I think this is so. This is why it's so important, whether you're a journalist or a commentator on YouTube, to know what the fuck you're talking about before, you know, going on viral rants. Because I didn't know that what you just said about that a lot of states you can't do a dirty break um so you, you actually it's a good thing before whether it be blasting marianne williamson or you know whatever uh, it is that other channels are doing to do some research talk to candidates because for example i remember when nina turner was running in uh, ohio for congress and the common thing was she should run as a green party candidate she should run as an mpp candidate and this was coming from like jimmy Dore and you know, other uh, big channels. And like, it took me two minutes to Google or ask somebody, well, the Green Party was uh, removed from the ballot in Ohio and MPP wasn't on the ballot. So it's like, there's so many people because, you know, obviously they're fed up with the Democratic Party, this and that, that aren't, you know, benefit of the doubt, just are maybe misinformed, but aren't doing the research to inform their voters that, yeah, no, she can't do not just Mary and anybody. She can't, you know, do the Democratic primary. And then if you know when they get fucked, uh, run in the Green Party or. So I think it's really important that we inform our viewers of the rules, because in a lot of states, for example, sure, you could technically run as an independent. But in a lot of those states like Cleveland, for example, whoever wins the Democratic primary. In every election for 30 years wins the general election. There's a lot of places where it's the same on the Republican side. Whoever wins the Republican primary goes on to win in a landslide. Now, that doesn't mean you can't run as an independent, but you should let people know it's a traditionally the primary is technically 
basically the general election. So my point this was a hard thing to to balance too, to a certain yes. extent, because if no one's running as independent because the media keeps telling them that only Democrats and Republicans have ever won, then you're not going to have that other information and those yeah. other facts out there. And so, like, it's like a, a chicken and an egg kind of yeah. thing, um, too. So that's one of the challenges you do have to tell. But I think part of it is the framing of the media. You know, when they say it's not a viable race because this person is independent and only a Democrat has ever won the seat. Well, is it there? Is it our job as journalists to say what's viable and not? But I, I like I said before, that's that was one of my biggest barriers because it cut my races off at the knees before we even got volunteers. We had the tools. We had the infrastructure. We were getting the voter voter list on, on some of these races. They were cut off at the knees before because of the newspapers and the media saying it's not viable campaign right out of the gate. Yep. So I, right. yeah, They're for right. me, that that's a big, that's a big thing that I keep coming back to because I saw it happen over and over again. And it was really difficult. That was one of our biggest challenges to overcome, honestly. But what I'm talking about is like what well, Craig's talking legitimately, it isn't viable if you're not allowed. So right. people need to, and then, then, if once you do the research or, and are informed, uh, informed about it, then people could organize. Well, maybe we need to start challenging that across these states. Right. Uh, we need to because that's disenfranchising to uh, remove that option from if you run in a Democratic or Republican primary and for, you know, to, to bar you from running third party or independent. So anyway. I got to dip That's out also next. another thing, which is a great conversation about open primaries, closed primaries, um, top two, obviously RCV. Uh, sorry to jut in there. But yeah, I mean, it's nice. I mean, the closed primary might seem detrimental, but I've heard also open primaries are worse because you can basically flood the, the ballot with two Democrats, two Republicans or whoever, you know, and you're still not helping that alternative candidate. It's more about getting the money out of the politics and making sure that that's handled and obviously having RCV because, you know, ranked choice voting allows you to still vote without any spoilers. So I think you need to try to figure some sort of approach that way. And that's why some of us are, are working on that structure. Great to see you, Jordan. Hope to see you soon. But that's another <laughs> major topic that we definitely should discuss. And it's been sadly since I was 12 years old when Ross Perot ran, was able to capture over 18 percent of the vote. And then took that independent campaign and turned it into the Reform Party. And we can't seem to get together to coalesce, to get to 5 to 10 to you know, 15% of the vote. It, it just saddens me. So I just hope that whoever runs uh, decides to keep a clear and open mind to supporting the green candidate that's out there. Because we really are the next vehicle that's going to have a chance of getting that percentage, I would think, and have the ballot access there. Thank you very much, Craig. And I will, one of the last question that I have, we have centered a lot on the Greens. We haven't talked as much about running independent. And I know that, you know, the Green Party, there's like this whole, you know, we support the Green Party. I understand where you guys are coming from. That's how parties work. Um, but I do want to talk to Terrence and Renee about like, um, there are a lot of races where you, there's not much difference between running as an independent or running with a party. That's just the facts. You can almost build up the same kind of infrastructure if you run independent. So there are opportunities there. Um, and I don't want to dismiss those. Um, so one of the things that I had a question about was people are looking at the shiny thing over here, the presidential election already. And in the meantime, what's happening at the state houses and municipal levels across the country are things like um, tightening the screws on local races through the Secretary of State offices with more and more laws um, making it harder for, um, may it, for instance, they were the, if folks in uh, Georgia were challenging voter rolls. They opened up a rule where voter rolls could be challenged by a party. So voter registration could be challenged by a specific parties. So, of course, Republicans went around and guess what? They picked out a whole bunch of black people, 200,000 black people, and they challenged those uh, voter registrations, right, in order to, to rig the system against them. So what do you tell people who are looking at the presidential and aren't focusing on the local about strategy within and outside of the electoral system as far as, like, 
you know, Jordan was mentioning that it's important to know these problems so that we can again, uh, then go and take those problems head on. What are some of the things that you guys have seen? And what do you think, as people who have all worked local races and, and have our attention kind of tor turned toward that as, as I have, um, what do you think, what would you tell folks? And I'll start with Renee and then we'll go to you, Terrence and Craig, if you want to, if you want to weigh in after, but what, what would you tell people who are looking to maybe run independent locally or about the importance of local politics while people are already online or arguing, arguing about if it should be Marianne Williamson, Nina Turner, Trump, DeSantis, and we're two years away from that nonsense. So what do you got to say, Renee? <laughs> so I think one of my biggest things that I always want to remind people is like, I'm, so I'm 46 years old and honestly, like not much changes based on who's in the White House. Like it, you know, it often just feels like passing the baton from one person to the next person to the next person. They all just keep reviving the same bad rules. Um, so, you know, as much as people enjoy these conversations about whether Marianne should run or this person should run or whatever, um, you know, if, if, if there isn't someone who's really going to galvanize working people and get non-voters out and get people, you know, even confident or interested in participating in the electoral process, this presidential thing is just not really, and I, I mean, I, I heard what you said, Zaina, so I almost, I hate saying it out loud. Like, I just don't even know that people are gonna be willing to do that in two years, right? Like we're almost a year and a half from having to vote for president again. I just don't know that anyone's gonna be able to convince, you know, 50 million people that they're worth, you know, trusting that they're gonna make some difference. So I personally am really, I really feel like it's important for people to understand that the majority of rules that create chaos in their lives are local rules, right? They're rules that are set by council members, by board members, by mayors. Like these are the people that are setting the structures up that they have to live within, you know, that are really affecting their material conditions. So I feel like people should really be having conversations about what needs to change in their community or their district that needs some attention, right? Like if you live in a place where Oh, we lost Renee. Oh no. <laughs> okay, well I can jump in and, and she can come right back in when she when she gets back. But yeah, I mean oh, oh there she's she right here. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Renee. Welcome All of back. a sudden it started spinning. I was like, you. I don't know what just happened. <laughs> so you know I just I, I really want people to start having that conversation about like what needs to happen here in my neighborhood, in my district, in my city, in my borough, that's gonna make a difference. And if someone decides that they're gonna run who's worth getting that type of national energy going, listen, I'm not gonna say I wouldn't be excited if somebody that I feel like might do something is gonna run, but I think I'm really more pressed about what's going to happen within my little tiny district with the new board member or the new mayor or whatever have you, because those are the things that are going to really have some effect on my specific material conditions on what happens in my house. People have to stop thinking that whoever's in the White House is going to change the things that are wrong in their neighborhood. I mean, Biden has done everything he can to remind people consistently that he does not care about regular people. He does not care about the majority of this country. That is not what the interest is. That is not what they care about. They don't care. So we have to start really talking to the people that are going to make a difference where we live, because that's that's really where the most energy needs to be. Yeah, I, I think Renee's pretty much right on there. I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's a reason why grassroots and local are synonyms, right? Uh, you know, if you can build something at the at the local level, it tends to bubble up if, if it's the right, if it's a good idea, you know? Um, and uh, I could be wrong. I think uh, Craig is uh, involved with uh, Voter Cho Choice NJ, uh, New Jersey, and I'm involved with Voter Choice MA, Massachusetts, um, to build ranked choice voting and what we're doing is we're starting at the uh, city and town level. Um, 
and you know just going city city and town by city and town and saying you know would you be willing to have your local elections run via rcv i happen to think that star voting is better but i think that rcv is a step in the right direction to more representative uh elections and if we get you know town by town city by city eventually people start to wonder well why isn't this happening at the state level um and eventually can be quick you know eventually can be in the span of a, a couple years um, and so, you know, when it comes to things like that, I'm also very much a, a proponent of uh, ballot initiatives at the state level. I know a number of states are not ballot initiative states, um, but the fact is, if you can elect someone, you know, to your state senate, your state uh, representative um, seat, then you can get somebody, hopefully, that is willing to maybe move forward an amendment to your state constitution that allows for ballot initiatives to be done going forward. Um, and th these are these are these sound kind of you know granular you know technocratic, but they actually really move the issues forward. And that's how I kind of came from a, a point of only thinking about federal level politics to thinking more regionally. You know, what can I do in the Northeast? How can I work with you know people like Justin in Maine? Um, you know, to to thinking about oh maybe I can run for you know a state senate and maybe I can make a a, a big difference. Um, you know, and hopefully we can pass, you know, for example, universal health care um, at the state level um, and then move, pass it in the next state. You know, uh, so this stuff tends to bubble up. And so, uh, to be honest, I, I, I resonate with Renee in the sense that I'm not as concerned about uh, the presidential level. Um, you know, I, I don't see that as where a lot of change is coming from, from. Unfortunately, I wish it was. And, you know, to be sure, I will be supporting, you know, folks in the primaries that I think can uh, move us forward. Uh, in the general, but there's so much, and, and that's why I'm so glad that we did, you were doing this uh, panel, is that there's so much uh, opportunity to, you know, move forward democracy reform, to move forward, you know, ballot initiatives that really change the game for people. And, and it's surprising, people are surprised when you tell them that you can do things at, at that level, that there's actually meaningful change to be done there. Uh, but once they hear about it, you know, you, you tend to see their eyes brighten up and they might start to, you know, be a little bit more engaged in the democratic process, you know, uh, going forward. And, and that's powerful. Yeah, because a lot and of I'm, stuff I'm sorry, I, I got to jump. I was about to say. <laughs> no, I've got a 12 year old that just started eating yep. cookies because I haven't started making dinner. And so I got to roll. <laughs> yeah, I was nice about to say, you, if you guys want to give your handles and where people can find <laughs> you and whatever organization you think people should be involved in i was gonna say we've kept you on for two hours let's let's uh let's tell folks if, good night if, and, if you and all don't your, mind just so i can jump um i r johnson 815 is me on twitter if you like listen to people complain about life and point out <laughs> facts that you're not really intent on on hearing i'm, I'm happy to uh <laughs> to engage um craig i just realized we follow each other so let's Let's communicate. I would love to keep in touch. And Terrence, I see you every week. So, you know, <laughs> it was good to see you again. Zaina, thanks. Love you. And Bye, thanks Renee. for the time. This was great. I appreciate it. You all have a good night. All right, Craig, you want to give your um, info, maybe what you're working on now and where people can find you? Sure, of course. Uh, real, real quick, I, I love and I support my independent friends that have run for office. There's some in New Jersey as well. And uh, anytime I can be of assistance, that's the best part about running for office is you learn and you can definitely advise and guide anybody. So if there's anybody nationally has questions, you know, feel free to reach out to me. There's a couple ways. Uh, Green for Hawthorne is my Twitter handle. Um, and then uh, Cayetano number four council on Facebook, or you can reach out to me personally, Craig Cayetano on Facebook too. But I'd definitely be happy to help and advise. But yes, I'm working uh, obviously with the Green Party, New Jersey, trying to organize there. You can check out us there, gpnj.org, obviously national, gp.org. Definitely, anyway, just uh, reach out anytime. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Craig. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. How about you, Terrence? <laughs> yeah, so uh, thanks, by the way. So great to meet you, Craig, and, and hear uh, you know some really useful information uh, <laughs> that I'm definitely storing away. Um, it's great to meet Jordan as well, and, and shout out to uh, to Renee and uh, to you, Zaina, and um, and to Justin. Um, but yeah, so you can find me uh, at Cudney for MA um, on the main on the main social media platforms: Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm I'm an elder millennial, so I'm not <laughs> on some of the more newfangled uh, platforms. But um, you know, I'm working on, uh, as I think I alluded to. 
uh, a grassroots organization called uh, Medicare for All Everywhere um, that's building uh, coalitions between states on um, state single payer initiatives. Um, I'm also involved with Housing for All Gloucester, a local uh, affordable housing group in Gloucester. Um, I'm involved with the Gloucester Coalition to Prevent uh, Domestic Assault, and I'm involved with, um, as I mentioned, Voter Choice MA to move forward, uh, Ranked Choice Voting in Massachusetts. I I'm all over the place, uh, keeping busy, um, also on the job search. Uh, so, you know, keeping very busy, shall we say, but uh, so good to talk to you. Thank you so much for having us on. Thank you, guys. Thank you all both. Thanks, Aina. Take care. Nice meeting you, Terrence. You too. All right. That was an awesome panel, you guys. Um, I thought that everyone was super informative. I did want to take some time to um, go through, in the meantime, before we start the uh, the super chats and the comments, which uh, I do want to highlight some of them because uh, there was some great info. And thank you guys so much for uh, participating in the conversation tonight. I do want to say that um, Status Coup has been one of the few that has consistently covered local, independent, and third-party races. If you know of anyone that's running, um, you can reach out to and uh, help me here, Colin. I can't find this one. <laughs> you can reach. Is it on here? Status coup. Oh, info at status coup.com. There we go. So uh, you can go to info at status coup.com, send an email, send us your information. We're interested in local races. We're, we're interested in what's going on in municipalities. The same with if you guys see legislation coming across or movements or action organizing, whether it's electoral based or otherwise, please let us know. We're always on the lookout and we're looking to bring people on to be able to, to have discussions like we did today or to be able to talk about their race or what's going on in their areas because uh, there is a lot happening at the national level, but also state and local that never make it to the news, not even in local newspapers. So please reach out to us if you have information like that that you would like to have, um, that you would like Status Coup to cover. Also, we have a show tomorrow night at 9 p.m., We'll be talking about, uh, we'll be covering and going live for the State of the Union Address. Mm, should be fun to hear what Biden's got to say about not doing anything for uh, the last three years. But <laughs> Tina Desiree Berg will be on that. Um, Ron Placone will be joining. I believe Jordan may be joining, but I'm not 100%. So that should be a really fun show. Um, we're going to be pulling out some of the information that he says, you know, confirming or debunking. Um, the information that comes out, uh, just sifting through the sifting through the you know deep rhetoric that comes when you know whenever we've got the uh, the scoutus and also wading through people uh, talking about how awesome his speech was and focusing on that <laughs> instead of focusing on the substance. So join uh, Ron Placone and Tina Desiree Berg at 9 p.m. tonight. Um, for a live viewing of Scoutus that's not hosted by MSNBC or Fox News. So uh, we could get uh, some different perspectives there. Also, um, we will be sending Louis D'Angelo. We're working to send him to the border to talk to migrants. Biden still has not reversed Title 42 and has, in fact, expanded it. And this is where... Um, from the Patriot Act, a holdover from the Trump administration, where refugees can be denied entry by the um, Department of Homeland Security. And right now, the states that are on the list are Nic Nicaragua, um, Cuba, and Venezuela. So it's very important that, you know, we hear from the people at the border, hear their stories. What are they going through? What is happening there? And uh, Louis D'Angelo is looking for a uh, looking we're looking to fundraise for a trip for Louis D'Angelo to be able to take to the border, to be able to talk to those migrants. So if you can, please donate um, to statuscoup.com slash donate. That would help us out tremendously. Or if you want to um, become a member of Status Coup, that helps us set our budgets for all year. Um, you could go to statuscoup.com slash join and join the Status Coup community. All right, let's take a look at, let's see, I there we go. I was having some trouble removing the banner. Let's see, I want to look at some of the chats that we've got going on. Chris Garrett, thank you so much for the $5. Thanks 
to status coup for hosting this discussion. The key to a vibrant democracy is an informed electorate. You have to ask the questions. One of the things I've learned doing um, all the races that I've done is a lot of people don't realize what it what it takes. You know, what are all the different things that you even need to get together to run? And it's not to discourage people from running, but people should be informed. What does it take to build a race? What, what does it look like to get ballot access? Um, what are some of the barriers? And then also to have red flags if, if people or organizations are asking for money and they're saying that they can't, that they're going to run candidates or they're going to do X, Y, Z, do a little bit of homework, find out, you know, if that, is that even plausible in this state, you know, um, and, and that's part of the responsibility of the press is to bring, bring that information forward. So it was really interesting to me to hear from some of the people that ran and, and some of the folks that uh, understand what it's like, like to build out, a, to build out a campaign. Dean Nord says, great show. Thanks. And then we do have one more super chat, but I wanted to look and see if uh, there were any other comments here. There's a ton. Thank you guys so much for um, weighing in. Bernie Sanders was actually 80 years in the past, the New Deal. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a very interesting uh, take. And uh, we definitely, one of the things that, that is true right now is that a lot of our pain points, like I had mentioned, are coming from the local office, but folks are, uh, folks are suffering. So when we hear, you know, about incrementalism or it's going to take 20 years to build a party or, you know, an understanding that the Democratic Party and the Republican Party has done nothing for us. And, and so if we elect candidates to that, then will they just be become corrupted? But at the state and local levels, there's a lot more opportunity to uh, to shake things up. So hope, hopefully we'll see some more races um, there that are outside of the Beltway. Several states, Ohio, um, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, West Virginia, in a lot of districts and areas, um, only one party runs. Um, for instance, in, in Kentucky, we had uh, 65 seats, it was, that ran uncontest in, uncontested and they were all Republicans. So great opportunity for an independent or a third party or someone to step in and to run in those races. A lot of low-hanging fruit. Um Let's see here. Actually, my kid is telling me it's time for dinner. So I'm going to go ahead and go to the um, last couple super chats. Let's see. Michael Kapoor, a healthy and informed electorate is a threat to the empire. Damn straight. Because if we don't know what is happening, we don't know what we can we have to fight. For instance, um, encouraging and growing ballot access. Um Challenging things in the courts that could potentially be unconstitutional, such as the the spoiler law, some have argued is unconstitutional, and I'm still waiting for a candidate to um, to challenge that and and challenge it at the Supreme Court level to say, hey, you know, I was basically swindled out of my primary running under this party, or I ran, um, for instance, if a Democrat wanted to. If somebody registered as a Democrat, which doesn't mean the party works with them, because I worked with dozens of people registered with the D by their name who the party worked against the entire time because they were running an insurgent campaign against an incumbent. So even the people that have D by, D's by their name aren't necessarily getting party support or working within the party infrastructure. But if somebody was to say, hey, um, I was swindled out in this primary and the party worked against me the whole time and challenge that uh, those spoiler laws that say that they can't switch their party affiliation. Who knows? Maybe it would make it to the local courts, maybe the Supreme Courts, but something possible that there might be possibilities um, for change. Carpe Diem says, do Democrats deliberately lose to fundraise? Uh, yes. <laughs> At least I believe so. Um, I think that I think every cycle, especially on the federal level, when things get really tough, they stop running people in certain districts um, with a calculated measure of losing the majority. And this is easy to research. This year was one of those examples, because as I had said, they were they were um, seats in Kentucky that were uncontested. 
And so when they lose the majority, what happens is, yes, you can fundraise two years, reignite people to get out, bring money in. And also you can kind of shirk off and bolster and, uh, you know, do the theatrics of having being the lesser of two evils. Right. <coughs> So that is something that they do. Or, for instance, they got behind Joe Manchin, knowing that Joe Manchin works against them every time. When there was a challenger against Joe Manchin, uh, Paula Jean Swearingen, who was progressive, the party went in hand over fist to support Joe Biden and to do everything, or not Joe Biden, um, Joe Manchin, and to do everything to keep Paula Jean Swearingen off the ticket or to... Um, you know, take her campaign out at the kneecaps. They would do things like have fundraisers or have uh, Democratic Party events that Paula would just show up to where they would put her materials in the back that were supposed to be for the primary. But they would put Joe Biden's on all or Joe Biden's. Dang, I got him on the brain. Joe Manchin's on all the tables. So they were literally promoting Joe Manchin as the choice, but yet he gets in office and all they did was complain because he's a he's a blue dog dim and not true. And he's holding up all this legislation. Why did they put so hard in for him against his uh, primary challenger? It's a good question to ask. And I believe that it's they need a rotating villain to pin not getting Medicare for all passed to pin not getting student loan debt forgiveness passed on so that they have someone that they can point to while they still placate to their corporate donors. Let's see. Um, Dinard said, great show. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining D and thank you so much for the 20 bucks. That helps. Uh, every little bit helps and we do appreciate it. We don't have a billionaire donors, millionaire donors. Um, <laughs> we don't have, you know, a big conglomerate behind us. It's just us and it's just you guys. And so anything that y'all can give to help anytime that you do is uh, publicly funded independent journalism and we appreciate it. It keeps me being able and Jordan being able to come on here and run our mouths and bring the guests that we bring on and cover the action and organizing and talk to uh, the candidates that we talk to and bring uh, um, folks on strike and, and uh, union actions and cover all of that. Otherwise, you know, we, we would be getting the same pressure as the mainstream media. So each and every one of you guys that uh, can donate or just like and share the streams and help get the word out about the content helps. Well, I think I will uh, call it an evening, but uh, remember tomorrow night at 9 p.m. State of the Union with uh, with um, Ron Placone and Tina Desiree Berg. Super excited about that. And uh, have a good night, all. Thank you so much for joining.